for those of you who are new and others who are just joining us for the first time or many times, I just want to let you know that the Dementia Caregiver Support Program of the Dementia Care Collaborative, we started at MGH back in 2017. I told you that we're part of the Palliative Care and Geriatric Medicine Division. And as many of you know, our mission for the program is to truly transform memory care. We exist at MGH to educate, connect and support patients, caregivers, clinicians, and actually we're open for all of these educational programs to the whole community. We offer care consultations to caregivers and patients at MGH, skills classes for caregivers, support groups for caregivers, health and resiliency programs. We offer two different exercise programs throughout the month. One is an Ageless Grace program with Maria Skinner, and the other is a wonderful strength and balance class with personal trainer Phil Golden. So you are all welcome to those. You're welcome to share that information with family and friends across the country. The Caregiver Support Program is largely funded through philanthropic support by mostly individuals. We're also supported through the Berkshire Bank, the Bresky Family Foundation, and the Satter Foundation. And we really acknowledge and appreciate all of you who have donated. If you're interested in learning more of how to support our program, please reach out to any of our team members. Go on the DementiaCareCollaborative.org website. And I am going to pass it on to our fabulous, my fabulous colleague, Barbara Moskowitz. Well, thank you, Judy. And hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you all this evening. I'm really looking forward to this talk with Dr. Ritchie, and I'm eager to tell you about her. She is truly a treasure. Uh, Dr. Ritchie is the Kenneth Meineker Endowed Chair in Geriatrics and Director of Research for the Division of Palliative Care and Geriatric Medicine at Mass General. She's a board certified geriatrician, palliative care physician, and health services researcher who conducts research focused on optimizing quality of life for those with chronic serious illness. Dr. Ritchie directs the Center for Aging and Serious Illness Research in the MGH Mongan Institute and the MGH Dementia Care Collaborative. So the honor is immense and I look forward to our talk and I have just a couple of comments, which I think you'll find very helpful. At the end of the program, uh, you'll be asked to fill out uh, an evaluation, or the, the evaluation will come in the mail by tomorrow. And when you complete the evaluation, you'll receive back Dr. Ritchie's slides from tonight with just very few modifications uh, of some people who whose privacy can't be uh, revealed. But the point is, you don't have to sit in your house right now and take notes. Everything you want to remember from tonight, you'll get on the slides. And that adds, obviously, to your comfort level. So welcome and uh, enjoy. Thank you. Thanks so much, Barbara. I really appreciate you. And thanks for um, moderating tonight's uh, discussion. I want to make sure that people can actually see my slides. So how are we doing? They, are they there for you? Okay, excellent, so glad. So let me get my cursor in the right place here. Okay, well, I am so happy to have this time with all of you and it would be so fun if we were all sitting together in one big living room and chatting about uh, how we can live our best life as we age, because I'm pretty sure many of you have some very good suggestions of your own, and I'm hoping during our discussion, we can hear some of your thoughts, uh, because you're some of you are experts, you are aging. In fact, we all are aging. So this is uh, hopefully going to be a, a, a shared time for describing uh, the great opportunities we have for living our best life and continuing to grow uh, as we age. 
So what I'd like to do first is just to um, level set around some of our common experiences of aging and uh, actually give you a chance to uh, put a few things in the chat that you see as sort of common experiences of aging and then go through three different ways I think we can move towards living our best life uh, as we age. One is optimizing our aging process, two is planning for the future, and three is growing. And so those are gonna be the three things that we'll talk about today. So uh, my hope is that at the end of our time together, you will reflect on your own life, reflect on your own habits, and say, what's one thing I can change? We are never, ever, ever too old to change. And so my hope is that uh, there will be at least one thing uh, at the end that you will go, I'm gonna try this one thing and see about creating a new positive habit, uh, maybe something that I haven't been doing so far. So I'd like to start by thinking about what some of our common experiences are as we age. And I'm gonna put a few in the slides and I'm hoping that you all will also put a few in the chat. Uh, you know, as we age, many things happen, but among them is our roles change. And we may have had one role for many years and that role may change because of changes in relationship or changes in um, what we're doing or changes in our uh, uh, health. So there are things that happen as a result of that. Um, there's also uh, changes in our um, living arrangements. There can be changes in our ability, uh, changes in um, who we spend time with. What are other changes that you have observed or experienced um, as part of the aging journey? And actually, I don't see my chat. Oh, there it is. It just popped up. So uh, I wonder if, Judy, you could just shout out the things that people are putting in the chat about aging experiences. Sure. Um, people are putting in things of isolation and sometimes loneliness, health, mobility, Physical body changes, loss, uh, so loss, loss, isolation, physical changes, health, mobility, difficulty with balance, slowing down, finances, depression, fear, job changes. Okay, uh, very helpful uh, to hear these um, reflections and to think about sort of what we're we're hearing. We're hearing a lot of things that sound hard. Um, and I'm wondering if there are things that also are um, things that are uh, meaning making or joyful that also occur with aging. Would people be willing to share those? Um, so we're getting wisdom, grandchildren, more time, freedom, relaxation, care less about the little things, freedom from responsibilities. Excellent. Thank you. Just Friends, to, there's a good friends. one. So just to create a little bit of a balance to some of the things that we were hearing, which are all true, all of what you said is true. And so what we experience as we age is we experience this interesting dynamic of um, growth, meaning, wisdom, and at the same time, and perhaps for, for good reason at the same time, maybe this is where some of the wisdom comes from, we experience loss, we experience um, a change in relationships, sometimes we experience loneliness, depression, changes in our function, et cetera. So then the question is, how do we optimize our well-being as we age? And I'm going to go through a number of things that we've learned from the scientific uh, literature. And, uh, and then we'll talk about uh, how this ultimately may be relevant uh, to you. So first is our diet. 
And there are many things that we can say about our diet, except that the first thing I'll say is that by and large, the traditional American diet is probably not our best bet for living our best life with aging. There are opportunities that we can take now, regardless of our age, to improve our well being as it relates to diet. And the first is actually moving to a plant based diet. Uh, we, many of us grew up um, where, you know, steak and potatoes was the order of the day. And unfortunately, that is not um, necessarily going to be in our best interest as we age. Why? Because it can increase inflammation. It can create um, a negative chain of um, epigenetic changes that it can turn on uh, genes that are not good for us, as opposed to turning on the, the ones that are um, are good for us. It can lead to oxidative stress, uh, mitochondrial dysfunction. It can change the length of our telomeres. It can affect our insulin resistance. It can affect our gut microbiome, et cetera. So the converse is that when we move to a plant-based diet, the opposite seems to occur. We have a reduction in inflammation. Uh, we have a reduction in oxidative stress. Uh, we have a better um, healthy gut microbiome, and um, a lot of other things seem to be distally related in terms of chronic conditions, physical disabilities, cognitive functioning, et cetera. So there have been a number of studies that now give credence to this. Uh, there was a study published uh, in July of 2020 in JAMA Internal Medicine that looked at the survival rates of 416,000 people who'd reported their diet and lifestyle 16 years earlier. And just to say that 16 years earlier was when they were ages 50 to 70. So they weren't 20 year olds, okay? Um, and what they found is that those who, in, in this study who shifted their calorie intake even by 3% from animal protein to plant protein, it, was cor it corresponded with a 10% decrease in death from any wow. cause over that period. Wow. Um, they also found that peoples in their 60s saw an average increase of eight additional years by making a switch from the modern Western diet to a more plant-based diet. So even a small change, not telling you to just give up all your meat in one fell swoop, but even one small change, maybe one less meal per week, of, of um, that is uh, meat associated, animal, animal uh, protein associated to more plant protein associated can have a really positive effect on your overall health and well being. The next thing is fat. So, back in the day, I think when I was early in my training, we sort of thought of all fat as bad fat. And what we've learned is that's not true. There's a spectrum of fat. And there's actually um, some types of fat that are good for us, just like carbohydrates. They're fat carbohydrates that are generally good for us and carbohydrates that are generally less good for us. And what we've discovered is that the thing that unfortunately many of us consumed early on in our lives, um, uh, margarine, for example, was back then was very high in trans um, uh, uh, saturated fat um, and saturated fat those two things actually lead to an overall increase in mortality, whereas monounsaturated fat and polyunsaturated fat and, um, seem to be associated with a decrease in total mortality. And so even making small changes in the type of fat that we consume can have a positive impact on our overall well-being and also um, our longevity. Now, many of you may have been um, have heard about intermittent fasting, and many of you may actually engage in intermittent fasting. There are many different kinds of intermittent fasting. There's alternate day fasting, where someone um, has a regular um, uh, consumption of diet one day and then fast the next day. Um, there's time restricted eating, which is where people only eat during certain hours of the day. Um, there are many different types of fasting. But interestingly enough, most of these regimens do affect our cardiometabolic health in a positive way. And they are associated with decreasing our blood pressure, our insulin resistance, and reducing our oxidative stress. 
Um, and there are some other studies, not always as consistent, that suggest that they can lead to favorable diversity of our gut microbiome um, and uh, perhaps around appetite regulation, but those studies are not as consistent. So just to sum up, um, any kind of, of fasting in moderation can be beneficial. Um, if, you're have, if you have trouble keeping weight on to begin with, this is not something you may want to adopt as your first change in terms of your diet. Um, but if you are of a healthy weight and um, have the, the interest, um, it may be worth looking further into intermittent fasting because of its uh, possible positive impact on our general um, uh, health and uh, well being. What about physical activity? So physical activity is one of those things now we have growing, growing, growing numbers of, of large epidemiologic studies from all over the world. And what we've discovered is that in general, um, we see, start seeing mortality reduction when we're engaging in 150 to 300 minutes per week of vigorous physical activity or 300 to 600 minutes per week of moderate physical activity or some combination thereof. Now, I don't know about you, but that seems like a lot of minutes to me. That being said, uh, it is possible to engage in, in physical activity that is moderate to um, um, vigorous. And some of these are actually things that you may be doing already. Moderate physical activity can be um, achieved through gardening, dancing, uh, walking. It doesn't have to be, you know, uh, getting on um, your exercise bike per se, that's really more vigorous activity. So things that are more vigorous are things where you really um, can't speak with um, without being out of breath while you're doing it. Whereas moderate activity, you can speak in short sentences and still um, um, engage in that activity. The other thing to keep in mind is that sometimes people say, oh, well, maybe a little bit of exercise, but you know, if you do too much, it's bad for you. In this particular meta-analysis with a lot of studies combined, there was no harmful association shown with people who actually went way over the 150, I mean, good for them. I'm so glad they have that much time. But if you even do up to 4X more minutes per week in terms of your physical activity, it doesn't seem to be harmful. The other thing I'll say is that in studies of things like walking or running, um, anything where you're basically moving forward in, um, in, a, in a sort of in a um, way with your body is not actually associated with um, joint, um, uh, increased joint problems. Um, usually the problem with joint um, issues come associated with trauma that many people experience um, from other kinds of sports that have torquing um, um, effects on people's joints and especially on their knees. So any type of physical activity, even if you're starting with zero now, going to five minutes a day, 10 minutes a day, is all heading in the right direction. So what I don't want you to take away from this is that, oh, well, if I can't do 150, forget about it. Actually, that's not the way it rolls. It's a linear relationship. And moving from wherever you are now to um, more physical activity of any kind can be um, quite powerful in terms of its impact, not only on mortality, but on emotional well-being and physical well-being, reduction in insulin resistance, um, and improving in cardiac um, fitness. The other thing to keep in mind is that we're not just talking about aerobic activity, but balance is important for preventing falls, and muscle strengthening activities are particularly important as we get older because, unfortunately, a natural part of aging is a reduction in muscle mass unless we use it. It's truly, you don't. if you don't use it, you will lose it. And it's one of those things that has to be continued over and over again. All right, so we've talked about uh, a diet, we've talked about um, physical activity. Another really important thing that we used to think of as nice, but we now know is actually physically critical for our health and well-being is social connection. I suppose if there's anything the pandemic told us, was it taught us was that, right? We saw people literally dying from isolation. 
And now we know from, from studies that actually occurred before the pandemic that social isolation is associated with premature death and is equivalent to the same thing as smoking 15 cigarettes a day. This, the unfortunate news is that social isolation, even for, before the pandemic, over the past two decades, has increased by um, 24 more hours per month of people spending it alone. Um, a third to a quarter of Americans feel lonely. They say they feel lonely. Um, and loneliness and social isolation um, has been shown both to increase premature death. I mentioned social isolation, but loneliness in, um, as well. So that is why last year, our Surgeon General actually created an advisory on the healing effects of social connection community. We used to think of this as a nice to have. Now we really need to think of it as part of what we do for our physical health. And I know for me personally, um, I moved from um, uh, another state to uh, Massachusetts right before the pandemic, not the best time to actually move and make new social connections. It's required a lot of intentionality to actually make friends connect and stay connected when so much of life is pushing us in the opposite direction. So what are some things that we can do for staying connected? First, take an inventory of where you are right now. Who are the people that you could call up and count on? Maybe it's zero. Okay, well, that's an inventory. That doesn't mean you have to stay there. Who, how might you connect with others? What are the things that you're interested in that you're willing to share with others? How might you volunteer? How might you actually engage in, in um, supporting and reducing social isolation for others? Consider multi-generational interventions, um, it's not interventions, multi-generational multi connections. There are so many young people who will benefit from your wisdom. You have something to offer them. And it's important to realize that when you're connecting with them, it's, this, it's a win-win. There's something meaningful that comes out of that. And um, you're giving a gift to another person um, who really needs it. Think about new hobbies. And if you're really stuck, if you're really having a hard time thinking about how you can get out of being alone, then seek help. Um, work with your, your doctor. Um, think about um, where you, ways that you might get additional professional help if you really feel like you're stuck um, in a place of isolation. Keep listening. So age-related hearing loss is the third most common chronic condition in older adults. Um, unfortunately, it's been, you know, stigmatized and um, sort of considered something that we shouldn't talk about. It is critical for our health and well-being. Um, it's thought that up to 8% of dementia cases are estimated to be from hearing loss. And there was an amazing study that came out a few years ago from the UK um, Brain Biobank that compared people with no hearing loss to people with hearing loss and hearing aids to people with hearing loss. And the people with hearing loss with hearing aids and the people with no hearing loss had the same um, risk for cognitive uh, decline, whereas the people with hearing loss had a much higher risk for cognitive decline. So it's not the hearing loss, it's the hearing loss without support and hearing aids um, or other um, ways to improve hearing that really make a difference um, in terms of our health and well-being. And as somebody who recently has had to get hearing aids herself, you know, it's an adjustment. It's kind of a pain, but the value of it is that p things suddenly are not things that you disengage from because you can't actually hear what's going on. You can engage and that intellectual stimulation is good for you neuronally, for your brain. Um, it's good for social connection. Um, and now it looks like it also is um, important in reducing your risk for cognitive decline. Sleep. So sleep has to be put on the priority list because lack of sleep is associated with um, obesity, illness, crankiness, impatience. Talk to my husband about this when I don't get enough sleep. Um, inefficiency in accomplishing tasks um, and a state of mental fogginess um, among other issues. So if you're having trouble falling asleep or staying asleep, it's really worth talking to your um, physician or um, another healthcare provider about what you can do 
um, to improve your sleep and your sleep hygiene. And I'll tell you, most of it is not through medications. It's actually through um, different ways of getting digitally disconnected, turning off your phone, TV, et cetera, um, avoiding uh, uh, extremes in temperature, especially extremes in heat um, right before you go to bed. It's getting enough physical activity early in the day um, and really thinking about minimizing caffeine intake, which is hiding in so many things. Caffeine is hiding in so many things. So there are just some simple things that can be done that when we stick to it really makes a difference. But really thinking about sleep is important. Here's another study that looks at sleep duration and mortality. And essentially what you can see is that those individuals who have um, not too much sleep, but not too little sleep, and especially not too, too little sleep, but below um, seven hours of sleep a night, uh, do much better in terms of their overall longevity. If you want a fun read, uh, Matt Walker's book on why we sleep is kind of fun. He talks about all the different ways that we can improve um, our sleep and um, our, the, the positive impact sleep has on our overall health and well-being. All right, so we've talked about now a number of things that relate to optimizing aging. What can we do to live better through planning? Well, it turns out there are a lot of things. And many of us uh, don't want to go there. Uh, but here's what I'll tell you as a palliative care physician, um, that when we plan, it exposes us to things that can be hard to think about so that when we actually have to walk through them, they're just not as hard. This is not actually uh, unique to thinking about um, hard things in our future, but it's actually what, what psychologists and psychiatrists do through exposure therapy is that when we incrementally think about things, when it's not actually a crisis, when we can have a way of thinking um, and we still have some level of control, it actually can improve the way we um, navigate uh, the challenge, the difficulty when it occurs. Uh, Maya Angelou said, hoping for the best, prepared for the worst, and unsurprised by anything in between gives us the best tools for being able to navigate our future. So here are a few things for us to consider. And this is not necessarily the easiest news to digest, but I think when we think about it, it can help us prepare. The first is that most of us will spend some time either in a nursing home or be dependent on others before we die. Okay, if that's our possible and likely future, how can we prepare for that? Also, many of us will be subject to or put at risk for scams. I mean, the creativity of scamming just astonishes me. And this is something that we have to be vigilant about. And the more we prepare for it, the more we actually put tools in place to mitigate against the risk of it, um, the better off we'll be. The last thing is there is going to be a time when someone else will be making treatment decisions for us. And the best thing we can do to actually speak into that is to make sure that those people that we trust are those decision makers and that they know what is important to us. They're not gonna, we're not gonna be able to know every single type of um, eventuality that's going to occur. But if we actually are thoughtful about this now when it is not a crisis, it makes it a lot easier, not only for us, but it's a gift to those that we love when we give them the information about what's important to us. So how might we do that? Well, the way I like to think about it is best case, worst case. So just like we talked about sort of best case, worst case associated with aging, and many of you all gave us some of those sort of challenges, there's good things that happen as well, right? So we want to think about best case, worst case as it relates to our living arrangements. This is what best case would look like. You know, I'll die with my family members all around me in my home that I've lived in for, you know, 50 years. This is what worst case looks like. What might in between look like? What, what might I be willing to accept? Um, and that enables us to actually think about what we would be willing to accept, recognizing that our best case may not be one of the actual options that we have. What about caregiving? 
What's my best case? What's my worst case? What about our finances, transportation, healthcare decision-making? Each of these buckets are things that we can actually walk through and do best case, worst case planning for, which gives us this, the ability to then think about what that next, next step is for getting us to that eventuality. So let's talk about living arrangements. Right now, you can start planning to make your home age-friendly, and not only age-friendly, but friendly for, for some untoward event that you hadn't expected. Now, this past weekend, I was in the hospital on the orthogeriatric service. That means that anybody who was older that came into the hospital that fell and broke something, I got to see. I will tell you there are many ways to break your hip, okay? More often it happens inside the house than outside the house. So what should we be doing? We should be planning now to make our home age friendly. Um, we need to think about what that looks like. It means making sure we have light, okay? This is something that um, does happen as we age. Our ability to actually adjust to darkness takes longer as we, as we age. Our cones and rods in our retina take longer to activate around darkness as we age. So what does that mean? Let's not make it so hard for our cones and rods when we get up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom. Let's make sure that there's lighting that helps us get there on the path. Add support now. If we start adding um, support bars, for example, in our bathroom, we might not need them for a long time, but somebody coming to visit us might be very grateful that those su support bars are already in place. Many people love throw rugs. Now, can I just tell you, throw rugs are dangerous. Please think about whether or not you truly need that throw rug in your house because they are truly, truly slipping hazards and tripping hazards. Uh, and then thinking about having at least one entry that is either no step or that allows you an opportunity to not have steps is critical. I'll tell you that in Boston, as you know, we have, uh, for those of you who are in Boston, we have many walk-ups, you know, two-story, three-story walk-ups, et cetera. And many people have two-story homes where their bedroom is on the second floor. Uh, when one of us breaks a hip, immediately we don't have an option of going directly home. We end up having to go into a rehab, rehab facility just by virtue of the fact that we don't have a way of navigating the steps in our life and in our home. These are things we can think about now. Um, the other thing is think about um, adding resources like a stair lift, um, um, a, um, um, emergency buttons, um, other ways to make sure that you are able to communicate to somebody else if something does happen and you happen to be by yourself. Plan for a time when you will need assistance, not an if, but when. Who would you want to be that, those folks that do that? What and where? Learn about long-term care services in your community. For those of you who live in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, there are many long-term care um, services that we have that are available to us. It's quite remarkable. Lived in many states. I can say we have more than most. And then talk to other people about your thoughts and plans. Trusted friends, if you have children, children, partners, this is really important. And it's also important to think about having a communal way of thinking about your life where we're not completely dependent on family members to do things for us because sometimes our family members move away. Sometimes that we lose them before we um, die ourselves. So really thinking about a communal approach um, towards support around living arrangements can be really valuable. What about finances? Same sort of thing. Think about having different types of formal financial caregivers. Think about who, if you couldn't make decisions for yourself, you'd want to be your power of attorney for your finances. That can be somebody you hire, or it can be somebody you trust who's not that you didn't hire. Um, become knowledgeable about scams. There um, are some really great resource guides out here. I put a few of the websites down below that I particularly like. The um, Federal uh, Deposit Insurance Corporation has some actually great stuff on becoming um, uh, savvy against uh, scams and also thinking about um, financial planning as we age. 
And think about saving for long-term care like we think about planning for college. We plan for college. We know that we're going to have to spend more money then. Well, given that most of us are going to need some support before we die, let's plan for it. And then it becomes less of a surprise for either us um, or those caring for us. What about healthcare decisions? The most important healthcare decision you will make is not whether or not you want to be a DNR. <laughs> it is who you want to be your voice if you don't have it. Because whether or not you go on a breathing machine or receive chest compressions is one of a thousand treatment decisions that may be in your path going forward. And if you get to the point where you're unable to make those decisions on your own, you want somebody that you trust to make those decisions. They do not have to be your family. They can be your neighbor. It can be your friend. This, um, this thing called Prepare for Your Care um, is a, a, a um, program that was developed by actually a colleague of mine at the University of California, San Francisco. And what I love about it is it doesn't just talk about um, uh, you know, whether or not you want to be put on a breathing machine. It basically talks about the journey of deciding who you want to make as your decision maker, how you would choose that person, and then some sort of common decisions that you probably want to communicate to others about um, how you feel about them and what's important to you. The thing I love about this particular program is that it has advanced directives that have been appropriately vetted by legal entities in every state in the country. So when you move from one state to another, you can actually um, just download the, the particular advanced directive for that particular state, which is what I did when I moved to Massachusetts. I had an advanced directive in California, no longer relevant. I had to get one in Massachusetts. I downloaded the Massachusetts advanced directive, filled the thing out, um, got a friend of mine to um, uh, sign as a witness by Zoom, because by the way, this was during COVID. And then I sat down with my family and said, this is what's important to me. This is why I'm choosing this person to be my decision maker. I'm not choosing you. <laughs> um, love you, but this is why I'm not choosing you. And by doing that, it created a breath of relief for all of our family. Now, I don't plan on having to make any treatment decisions anytime soon, but literally I could walk across the street when I'm done having our little conversation today, get hit by um, you know, a, a speeding motorcycle or a truck, and I would not be able to make decisions for myself if I had, if, you know, if I, if I lost consciousness. So these are relevant and important for us wherever we are on our illness journey um, and on our aging journey. Okay, now let's talk about the thing that I think is the most fun to think about as we age, and that is growing and adapting. I think one of the most fun things that we can do as we age is to lean into resilience. So what do I mean by that? Resilience is the process of adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. This is our opportunity. Our adversity will be upon us if it hasn't been already. We will experience trauma we will experience tragedy. How do we rise even when we're in those spaces? That is the opportunity that we have from the standpoint of resilience. And just like strength training, we can actually do things now that will help us become more resilient going forward. So what are some of those things? Oh, and this is a wonderful quote by Charles Darwin. Um, it's not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent. It is the one that is most adaptable to change. Now, you know, I think there's this sort of thing out there um, that you'll hear sort of a, a, like, you know, I paid my dues. I don't have to change anymore. <laughs> I, I don't think that's actually our birthright. Our birthright is an opportunity to adapt and change across our whole lifespan. And this becomes, I think, in some respects, more challenging as we age because we have an expectation that we don't have to change. But I would suggest to you that because of the adversities we will face, 
it will ask that we do more and more to change. So what are some of the features of resilience and adaptation? This comes from um, the behavioral science literature. It turns out that having a positive affect, um, engaging in self-acceptance, um, pursuing personal growth, developing new skills and um, having mastery over them, uh, enjoying uh, uh, avenues for transcendence um, and social coherence. These are all features of resilience and adaptation. What are some things that we can do that are more sort of uh, at the micro level? Well, we can engage in appreciation and mindful awareness. So what do I mean for that? by that? I mean that right now, this moment is a gift. I feel deeply grateful that I get to spend this time with 46 to 45 of you, um, that we have this opportunity to be in community together. And there are so many moments that we can be aware of, be present to, enjoy, as opposed to doing what I certainly am prone to do, which is either worrying about the past or being regretful, I mean, excuse me, being regretful about the past or worrying about the future. Those things do not serve us in the same way as being fully present and aware to this moment, the gift that we have right now. Happily, there's some really awesome tools that are coming out that are based on the behavioral science literature that are there for us. I put three here. These are all free. There are also ones that are not free that are pretty cool, like Headspace and Calm and 10% Happier. Um, but this um, um, program called the Healthy Minds Program App um, is a, a, a scientific-based program that enables you to actually think about resilience, adaptation, um, awareness, and getting so that uh, what I call we aren't hijacked by our amygdala, we actually have control of our emotions, we can self-regulate and we can grow. And um, I, I would love to hear if any of you try one of these um, out, what it's like for you. It's certainly been a game changer for me personally. Then there's thinking about happiness as a muscle. So many of us think of happiness as something that just happens, something that just is or is not, as opposed to something we pursue pursue and actually embrace as a muscle. Um, but the, the interesting thing is that there's now some, some, some interesting studies that suggest that indeed, actually we can build the happiness muscle um, by giving our brain the opportunity to scan the environment, not for threats, but for the positive. Um, and this is, you know, um, an interesting dynamic because, you know, evolutionarily, our brain has been um, wired to look for threats. We are looking for something that's going to hurt us around every corner. And, you know, there are things that can hurt us, but that often robs us of joy and happiness because we are not taking into account all the good things that are right there in front of us. Some of you may have um, uh, watched this uh, TED talk by um, uh, Sean Atcher, but if you haven't, it's a fun little 10 minute TED talk that you can listen to. And what he talks about, and he also writes about it in the book called The Happiness Advantage, is that there are, there are a few things that we can do that really can inculcate happiness into our life on a day-to-day -day basis. The first is gratitude. And what he recommends is writing down three new things that you're grateful for every day. And that when you do this, you basically are rewiring your brain for optimism. Now, when I watched Sean Atcher's talk, which was, uh, I think around sometime, let's say 2018, uh, I was intrigued by this. And so at that point, I started um, engaging in a gratitude journal. And every morning when I got up, I would write at least three gratitudes. Uh, my husband also decided to do this with, with me, except that he's often does whatever I do with more enthusiasm. And so his approach was not just to write three gratitudes, but to write gratitudes until he felt better. So if he woke up, it was a particularly kind of crummy day, you know, 
he got some bad email, maybe the overnight, he would write gratitudes, including things like running water, electricity, you know, I didn't get bit by a dog. I mean, some, some hilarious things that he would write until he felt good. And he said he could always get to that point when he wrote down gratitudes that by the end, he would feel better. And I always thought that was hilarious because I was, I'm just, uh, I'm not that enthusiastic. So I stuck with the three. Um, the other thing is spending two minutes describing a meaningful experience that you've had over the past 24 hours. Um, a way to do this is at the end of your day to think about something meaningful or something that you've learned from that day and write it down. This is something we've actually started doing recently. Very fun. Um, it takes work. Sometimes I'll think like, what did I learn today? What, did, what was it? I, you know, especially something like that's, that's enriching <laughs> um, or something meaningful. And by and large, if you really rack your brains, you can think of things and that creates this positive um, sort of vortex that moves us away from sort of our neg negative predisposition. Think about having 15 minutes of fun. Um, we've already talked about meditation and mindfulness. And then a conscious act of kindness is another thing that we know actually promotes happiness when we take two minutes to do something nice for someone else. Writing somebody and thanking them for something, writing them um, uh, uh, to, or, you know, sending somebody um, a book or something you've been thinking about. Small acts of kindness, wherever they are, are life-giving and um, happiness promoting. The last thing I wanna talk about in terms of sort of uh, resilience and um, adapting um, is this whole concept of our internal narrator. Uh, so we have this internal narrator that's chatting at us and saying all kinds of stuff. Interest it's very interesting actually to, to pay attention to your internal narrator. Um, and more often than not, uh, it's not just telling you your thoughts, but it's representing uh, your feelings. Um, the thing to keep in mind is that for most of us, our internal narrator is wildly inaccurate. Our internal narrator tends to catastrophize. It makes things worse than they actually are. That's why we need other people to tell us, actually, it's not that bad. Um, our internal narrator can engage in self-judgment. Um, it can actually do um, tell us um, that we are um, not, um, you know, uh, worth anything or not amounting to anything. It can engage in self-sabotage. Um, it often does not serve us well. So the thing I would encourage you to think about is to, when you hear these little things chatting in your brain, you're this, you're that, is to ask yourself, is that narrator serving me? Is it actually helping me? Or is it actually not productive? And when we disengage from that narrator, we end up having a control and power, of our power over our brain that many of us did not even realize we had. It's an amazing experience um, when you can rise above what it is that you're uh, inner narrator is telling you and rewrite the story from a broader perspective of your higher self. So uh, I hope that today you've thought maybe of one new thing that could help you live your best future life as you age that you aren't doing right now. Now I'm get a guessing with this a guest audience that many of you are doing a lot of these things but I'm hopeful that there's just one thing that you could go, hmm, I'm gonna try that one thing uh, because it is my hope that when you do that, you will uh, grow in new ways. I'd like to actually end with a, a poem by Julia Fehrenbacher uh, that I think speaks to some of the things that we've just talked about. I'm making a home inside myself, a shelter of kindness, where everything is forgiven, everything allowed, a quiet patch of sunlight to stretch out without hurry, where all that has been banished and buried is welcomed, spoken, listened to, and then released. A fiercely friendly place I can claim as my very own. 
I am throwing arms open to the whole of myself, especially the fearful, fault-finding, falling apart, unfinished parts, knowing that every seed and weed, every drop of rain has made this soil richer. I will light a candle, pour a hot cup of tea, gather around the warmth of my own blazing fire. I will howl if I want to, knowing this flame can burn through any perceived problem, any prescribed perfectionism and lying limitation, every heavy thing. I'm making a home inside myself where grace blooms in grand and glorious abundance, a shelter of kindness that grows all the truest things. I whisper hallelujah to the friendly sky. Watch now as I burst into blossom. I look forward to watching you as you burst into blossom. And I look forward to our working together to live our best life as we age. And with that, I'll stop. And thank you for being here and listening. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ritchie. And we uh, encourage everyone, please, to put comments, questions in chat, which we'll review. I'd like to say, Dr. Ritchie, that, um, uh, well, thank you, because um, it was overwhelmingly wonderful. But And what's so striking is uh, with the abundance of research and information you gave us, your theme is for us to think of one small change. And and, and it, it, it resonates because that is so not our culture, right? Uh, if we're gonna go on a diet, we have to lose 60 pounds. If we're gonna exercise, it's five miles, to, it's everything. And it it, 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 it felt, it feels, it really resonated to, to have uh, a scientist uh, tell us that one small change goes far. So thank you, thank you for that. It's extraordinary. And I'll turn it over to other folks. Now, at 5:45, you were talking about fats in our diet, and you, you know, and she asked, and I think this is the, um, uh, about does that include fish? Yeah. Think... So, in so fish um, are high in um, omega three fatty acids, and um, and seem to be an important part of them of. Uh, um, many diets that have been shown to have positive impacts on both blood pressure and on cognition, um, especially um, uh, deep sea uh, cold water fish like uh, salmon and uh, sea bass, excuse me. <laughs> and um, what, where they fit in sort of the spectrum of, 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 of plant-based diets is that obviously fish is not plant. Um, but I think in the spectrum, there's more um, sort of uh, scientific premise for engaging in the consumption of um, especially cold water fish like um, salmon, for example, tuna, uh, than there are for like uh, traditional um, uh, red uh, meats uh, from, from animals. So while I didn't speak to it, it is a type of fat that actually is considered mainly good for you type fat as opposed to the saturated fats that you see um, in in um, in most animal traditional fat. And a follow-up uh, by from Sharon, does a plant-based diet exclude dairy products? So, okay. Um, you know, this gets back to what Barbara said earlier about um, incrementalism, okay? So I, I am a big fan of just going from one thing to the next. So in the, in, in the most um, pure sense of the word, yes, a plant-based diet excludes dairy. But I remember just going from 3% from animal-based diet to a plant-based diet, which doesn't mean completely giving up everything that you are accustomed to, to consuming makes a difference in terms of your health and longevity. Uh, I will say that um, in my own journey, uh, where I, um, you know, for many years was a, an omnivore and then um, moved to being a vegetarian um, um, about a decade ago, I still consume dairy products. I think if I were being more pure, 
Um, and maybe a next step in my journey would be to have less dairy products. Um, but yes, dairy products are not considered plant-based um, because they're animal-based. But I think in our journey towards a plant-based approach, um, you know, we have to decide how much we're willing to give up. And some people, it's very hard for them to give up their dairy products. Thank you. And uh, Daniel uh, uh, did follow up uh, by asking for any transcript for sources shown. Yes. Yeah, so what I will do um, is I will put some of the references on the last slide so that you can um, see some of the, the, the studies in particular. It sounds like uh, Daniel might be interested in um, for you to be able to sort of ex um, study yourself. Happy Great. to do that. I also um, wanted to appreciate the, the comment about um, how it's harder to be accepted into some senior groups as a person of color. Um, and uh, I, I can imagine that that is true. And I appreciate this person's um, uh, willingness to take risks and still engage um, even when it's, when it's hard. Um, so thank you for sharing, sharing that. But that is very important. Um, sorry, I missed that. Um, I have a question while we're waiting for others to add. Um, you you spoke about how important loss of muscle mass is, that it, it's a part of aging, but, but it, it costs us because it, we're more prone to falling and such. I often uh, hear people who feel dejected if they've had the flu and if we're in bed for five days or go to um, you know a rehab where we're still in bed etc cetera, etc cetera. but my, the question is if we've experienced loss of muscle mass secondary to being ill can you regain that absolutely okay, okay. absolutely and is it going to be a journey to regaining it yes but it absolutely can be regained you know, so I just, I'll give you an example. Um, being in bed uh, is not unlike what happens to the astronauts when they're up uh, in space. Essentially, we, we no longer are in, in sync with gravity and gravity actually helps us uh, with our muscles. Um, and when we're sick, of course, then we have even more stuff going on. Uh, but the good news is the astronauts come back to, to, to land and they work and they get stronger. And when we go through um, any kind of illness or, um, or you know, broken bones, it is amazing how many people come back stronger um, after an illness. I think there's there's a kind of like reset button that can happen, and people are interested in sort of um, becoming a, um, a a newer version of themselves. And so, just because you've lost muscle mass, do not despair you can gain it back um, and it will take work. So um, the other thing I'll say for uh, is that many times uh, we think that um, uh, heavy weights are, are not something that we should do. We, we can use heavy weights for, for strength training, just do them with guidance because you can, be, you can get hurt more um, with the use of, of heavy weights. Thank you. And Karen's comment now is, I'm very concerned about, quote, no beds available. She's talking mm -hmm. about long-term care and the increasing need for long-term care and the wait list. This is a great source of stress for me as I'm trying to place my loved one. How does one plan for this? Oh my gosh, is this hard? I um, completely agree that this could be, I mean, if you're going through this right now, I'm, I'm so sorry that you're going through this because it is a very stressful time um, to find um, long-term um, long care and long-term care beds. So here's what I would say is that there, there is, um, the, the weights are real um, and they are not forever. Uh, if you are able, while you're in this weight mode, to be able to go out and look at different facilities, um, that's going to be critical. And the things that you're going to be wanting to look for in the facilities is not how pretty it is, but how people seem. 
What is the vibe, the culture, um, essentially even the happiness quotient among not only the um, residents, but the staff? Um, I think oftentimes the bells and whistles are what we pay attention to, but do pay attention to actually the culture and the vibe of a facility. And if you can start working on that now while you're waiting, then you can identify those places that um, align with your your values and with the culture that's important to you. Um, and I will say this is an incredibly difficult time um, for um, getting long-term care support in any shape or fashion, whether you're trying to get support in the home or support um, um, in, a, in an institutional setting. So what you can do for those of you who are sort of, in, this is still theoretical, is start planning now um, and getting to know those facilities now. You know, this is actually where you can also volunteer um, in some of these um, facilities, and then you really get a sense of how things are. Um, it creates meaning and purpose. Um, at the same time that you're um, learning about how it's going. Now, if you're a caregiver yourself, you may not have the luxury of volunteering. Uh, then you may actually have to set up an appointment to, to check out some of these facilities. But um, I would uh, not just uh, base things on somebody's star rating. Remember, star ratings, by the way, are based on a few specific things that may or may not be relevant to your particular situation. So it's very important for you to be semi-informed by the star rating, but the star ratings are not like your Amazon reviews where you get the 5,000 people putting in their reviews. If it's, if it's a CMS, Center for Medicare, Medicare S Services, um, Medicare Compare rating, that's based on specific quality metrics that they're looking at. They're important, but they may not be the only thing that's important to you or to your um, care recipient. Christine and Barbara, the, I'm sorry, there are a few questions that were sent directly to me. So okay. I'll bring Please. those forth. Um, any effect on diet if I need um, 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 niprazole, um, niprazole for GERD? That's yes. one. Any thoughts yes. on that? Yes. So omeprazole, um, it does what it's supposed to, which is it reduces acid production in your stomach. Um, it also means that you may be less likely to absorb certain others of other kinds of nutrients and most particularly vitamin B12. Um, so it's really important to either take B12 as a supplement if you're on omeprazole or at least have your doctor check your B12 level. Um, because it can um, essentially, B12, when we consume it, is attached uh, to an, another little receptor, and we need acid in our stomach to basically break it apart and make it available to be absorbed. Um, and so when we don't have acid in our stomach, then we are, um, un, it's called intrinsic factor, the B12 doesn't detach from the intrinsic factor, and so it's less likely to be absorbed. So B12 is one, there are a few others that are less likely to be absorbed. So it is worth um, thinking about uh, a multivitamin if you are um, taking something like a omeprazole um, because it also has been associated with um, uh, reduction in bone mineral density. So just keep in mind that it's obviously important, you need it probably, and it's important for your quality of life, but also talk to your doctor about um, whether or not you either need to be tested for B12 um, uh, deficiency or whether or not you should just take a, a supplement, which you can get over the counter drugstore. Thank you. He also asks for a healthcare agent, I would want to be sure that I do not get overdosed with antipsychotics. And he's um, said that he's talking about the use of post hypnotic suggestion as a better way to deal with dementia behaviors. Yes. Any thoughts on hypnosis? So we, I think I've had a conversation with um, uh, somebody about this and um, there are some interesting preliminary studies about um, uh, hypnosis as therapy for both um, dementia behaviors and also for um, <coughs> reduction of risk for cognitive function. I'd like to see a few more studies, but uh, it's interesting, promising, and uh, I, I think this falls under the stay tuned category. 
Okay. Okay. And there is a, Judy, you, you, you're finished with your questions. Okay. There's an important question. How can one get help for part-time help for a caregiver? Yes. So there are a number of different ways to get um, help for caregivers and uh, um, and they fall into a number of different categories sort of what's needed. So um, if you need help, just like getting air, you know, getting errands, go, you know, people going on errands for you or things like that, that's going to be a different kind of help or maybe shopping or um, even cooking compared to getting help with um, support for like uh, somebody who really has trouble with the, um, things like bathing and dressing and um, mobility, which is a really different kind of help. So the first thing is just what kind of help does someone need? Um, and uh, and then um, based on that, then I, there are a number of different venues that you can take. For, so if somebody who needs more of sort of what I would call slightly more skilled help, for someone who has um, functional, meaningful functional challenges, oftentimes people will go through home skilled home health agencies because these skilled home health agencies have to have aids that they um, uh, that they actually um, pay to do uh, work along those exact same lines: bathing, dressing, transferring. So these aids have some level of training. And then there's a sub, many of these home health agencies also sort of on the side have the opportunity for people to pay out of pocket for these same aides who presumably have been vetted, have had, you know, criminal background checks, all that. Um, and so there's some value in potentially going through a service that does that. You can also, you know, um, if, if you have not that kind of need, um, go through like I think the growing number of sort of service delivery programs that are out there um, that uh, will do things for you and college students, that kind of thing. Um, and then don't forget that um, at least in the Commonwealth of Mag Massachusetts, um, we have uh, what are called um, um, aging services access points or ASAPs. Um, and when you call them and talk to them about um, what kind of uh, uh, part-time services they often will be able to give you some additional information. There's some, um, and Barbara, you know this better than I, so I should actually turn this over to you. There's also a few other um, uh, companies and service pro nonprofits that we work with that offer um, these services. Do you remember, Barbara, you probably have them on the tip of your tongue. Uh, well, actually, the uh, questioner uh, wondered about senior centers, and uh, and that is a good touch point. Um, typically, every community has, especially in Massachusetts, in many ways, we're fortunate. Um, I often recommend, as Dr. Ritchie said, the ASAP, and that is there are 30 in the state, and they're regional. And I can put while well, I could put the telephone number uh, up on chat, but uh, a very good place to start is to go to the senior center of the community where the care is needed. Uh, typically, the executive director and the small professional staff of the senior centers are very much aware of who's doing what, what agencies are well staffed. Um, and they also are often aware of some individuals who might be retired or uh, looking for part-time work. So uh, that's a place where you may find some part-time help. Um, so, and I just put in the chat, um, Barbara, the Massachusetts Care Planning Council, Massachusetts Senior Centers, which basically has a phone number for each of the um, uh, yep. counties. In fact, some counties have more than one. Um, that can be helpful to you. Um, there's also some some communities have um, seniors helping seniors uh, programs. Uh, there's um, uh, there's the villages movement. So there are villages um, um, programs where essentially it's a membership type program where people also help each other um, across the state, actually across the country. Um, our very own Judy Willett uh, was 
um, the, the the beginning of um, the village um, helped with the beginning of the villages movement. So there are a number of different tactics to take. And actually, I think having these kind of conversations um, can be helpful. Um, also, don't forget faith communities. So many faith communities have um, a, a, a sundry of different um, ministries related to um, uh, support, senior care support, et cetera. So um, it's worth sort of thinking about the portfolio of options, what your values are, what's important to you, and then maybe choose, you know, three to five to start with that um, and, and do some exploration. And I have uh, two other quick comments. I, I just put in chat, the Executive Office of Elder Affairs uh, is the large umbrella um, agency uh, of our state. So if you were to uh, Google eoea.gov, you'll see all of the, uh, an index of long-term care supports, mass health, insurance. That's where you'll also get a good start. Dr. Ritchie, can, can we come back to something that was at the very beginning when Karen asked us, asked you about the struggle looking for a nursing home? So you've talked about the whole spectrum of nursing home, home care and all. And with our program where so many of the caregivers are caring for people with dementia, that represents a very different skill set in the nurses in a nursing home or assisted living or the person who would come into the house. And I, I think that makes the challenge which you spoke to so well even harder to find an aide who understands dementia as opposed to someone who's frail in bed. I just wanted to raise that. Uh, perhaps you can speak to that. Yeah, and um, uh, the other thing I wanted to, I, I'm so glad you brought that up. Um, the other thing to uh, keep in mind is that, um, as, as Barbara mentioned, there are specific sort of competencies that I think help um, us and help um, care care caregivers, both um, paid and non-paid caregivers, um, become more dementia friendly. And I'm going to put also in the chat. Um, oops, it didn't go through. Sorry. Um, uh, here we go. The um, Dementia Friends Massachusetts. If you're not familiar with Dementia Friends Massachusetts, because they also have. Um, a lot of training for just a, a, an array of different kinds of um, people, uh, volunteers, um, people like uh, AIDS, um, various other systems of care to help people become more dementia knowledgeable, what I call dementia capable, uh, so that they um, uh, provide more aligned care and um, don't engage in, in care that actually could be potentially harmful to people living with dementia. Thank you. Any other questions or comments uh, from our wonderful group tonight? I have one other, just if you could speak to, or if anybody wants to comment. Um, you did talk about the uh, connection between movement and mood. Uh, uh, and I just wonder if you could speak a little bit more to it, or if anybody wants to contribute in chat, I mean, does a walk with your dog in the morning change your day, uh, even if it's a 10 minute walk absolutely. or, you, you know? Absolutely. Any movement can. I mean, I think this is the thing that's unfortunate is that we can move into a negative spiral around um, our function. The less we do, the less we feel like doing. And the only way to get out of it is actually to do something we don't feel like doing. And yet when we do that, what we find is that it actually um, has a, a sort of a positive effect on everything with respect to our um, well-being. So yes, absolutely. A 10-minute walk. I'll tell you, my 10-minute walk with my dog in the morning is a game changer for me sometimes. Not every day, but many days. So um, I think, yes, this gets back to what we were talking about um, earlier, which is we don't have to swallow the ocean here. We can make small steps of change that can help us um, move into that place of growth and resilience that helps us um, age in a way that is um, more fulfilling and um, more um, 
a joy filled and it can be small steps, just like you said, Barbara. And I hope you can see how many people are thanking you and commenting on what a wonderful, wonderful presentation. And I have one last question um, and, and yet another one, um, uh, but uh, it's about how difficult it is literally, but also from a point of view of my inner narrative for caregivers to say, I deserve time. I deserve that 10 minute walk and, and, and deserve isn't, it's all, It's sometimes I don't have the time. Um, and since so many people with us tonight are caregivers themselves, uh, it is a struggle. We understand because when, anyway, could you just speak to that? Because we know that the mortality rate, the illness rate for caregivers is high. Yes, yes. So you all have heard this. It's not the first time you've heard, but it is true that, um, you know, you have to put your oxygen mask on before you can put it on somebody else. You really cannot sustain caregiving without actually caring for yourself. And this is a very tough thing for many of us to swallow. And sometimes we feel trapped. Like how the, how, how on earth am I going to be able to actually care for myself? I'm so exhausted um, this is where I think getting help is critical. Sometimes we get so tired, we can't even engage in creative thinking about potential solutions. And, uh, and so I really think getting help, um, you know, Barbara is, is a, a consummate creative thinker in this space, but getting help around what we can do to, um, just offer us just a little bit more so that we can be um, in a place where we can actually give is critical. And so it's, I, I think, you know, it's truly one of these situations where we have to say, we must care for ourselves. We cannot um, continue on um, this work without, and this is a very tough, I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to suggest that this is easy for two seconds. This is actually quite hard. And this is where oftentimes we need other people to creatively problem solve with us. What might be a way I can get 30 minutes to myself every day? You know, like what might that look like? Uh, that often requires some creative thinking on the part of some other person with us because we just like, we just can't see it. Yeah, thank you. What a wonderful way to, as we come to the end of the program, um, to endorse uh, a caregiver's need for self-care uh, specifically. Thank you. Any final questions? Uh, everyone is looking forward. Um, it's an eye, um, you know, there's someone who just said really an eye, an eye opener. Thanks for the information. Really looking forward to the slide of resources. Um, so I think everyone has felt very nourished tonight. And I, I know I heard the message of one small step I'm going to do. And uh, it's really very, very exciting. Um, any final co comments in chat before we wrap up? Judy, is it time to wrap up? Oh, ah, thank you. I'm interested in Sorry, Julia. Uh, thank you, Julia. I'm interested in social groups of seniors who like to go out to dinner. Dating as a senior is challenging at best, but I would love to have a network of people who still want to enjoy life with others. Any thoughts? Oh, Judy, the village movement. Yeah, there's, there's, I think this gets back to, I mean, it's so much easier now than it used to be, but it's still not easy, just to be clear. Um, but we talked about the villages movement. I think the villages movement is a great way to develop friendships. Um, and um, if you live in the city of Boston, um, reach out to, to um, Judy and me, and we can connect you with the uh, village movement that's here in, in, in Boston. If you live outside, there may be connections. I would think about the things, you know, you said you liked to, to, to go out to dinner. Um, there are ways to find um, through a number of different uh, 
methods, not through dating apps, <laughs> um, but through hobbies, the ways to connect with other people. So, um, you know, one of my friends, uh, she has discovered that there is a Scrabble group at the, at the public library. And she has started going and, and she says, I know nothing about Scrabble. Um, and she goes there um, to 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 uh, learn about Scrabble and to make new friends. So I think the public library, I think looking at um, uh, meetups on bostoncal.org, again, if you live in Boston, um, it does mean looking both digitally and um, and then locally in whatever sort of communities of connection are around you, um, you will find those people. I have been surprised how with just a little bit of kind of, oh, and the other thing I'll say is don't worry about being rejected. People will say no, it's okay. Just keep at it because it may take, you know, four or five or six people to before you find somebody that's like, actually, I kind of like to have dinner with this group of this person with a, a bunch of other people. But, you know, I just, just don't, just don't take no as to, as as a stop or as rejection. It just means somebody's busy. They're in a different season of their life, um, and and uh, move on. And to show that I've learned tonight a lot, I will be careful with my internal narrator. If someone says no, right? I just turn it off. Turn it off. Okay. Um, I think that brings us to the end of what has been a marvelous uh, evening. And again, please, everyone, remember, you'll be receiving uh, online an evaluation form. And when you complete it, you'll then receive back Dr. Ritchie's slides with the resources and everything we all want to have from tonight. Um, just want to mention that uh, we have another wonderful program coming up. Uh, and on March 5th, all of you will receive a notice uh, in our health and resiliency program. Speaking of movement and movement of any kind, Christy Harvey is going to uh, present on restorative chair yoga. So you see, you need not sign up right away for the Boston Marathon. Restorative yoga is a wonderful way uh, to, to nourish your mind and body. And um, look forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritchie. And thank you all for coming. Appreciate it. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.